welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. KDArmor.com is your one-stop shop for the most affordable body armor, period. With packages starting at $169.99 and free shipping on every order. Katie offers soft armor and rifle threat rated armor up to level 4. Go to KDArmor.com and get your body armor today while you still can. Mention this ad and receive a free tactical scarf for a limited time with any body armor package. Today's guest is David the Good from the SurvivalGardener.com. David, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's great to have you back on. Uh, 2016 was kicked off by the worst opening trading day of any year since 1932. Uh, that type of volatility provides a re- reality check and gets lots of folks thinking about how they could be less dependent on a failing system. Do those types of events serve to keep you motivated? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... When I started my first website, I called it Florida Survival Gardening. And the idea was, um, you know, economic survival, personal survival. I mean, just just the amount of money that we save off of growing our own food. You know, I I have sailed through, you know, the the 2008 thing because I was expecting that crash. And, you know, so we ditched our we ditched our houses and we, you know, we gardened in a rental and did all kinds of stuff. It just kind of floated through and you come to the other side of it. Every time something like this happens, I think I am so glad that I have hundreds of pounds of food in the ground. I've got the tools that I need to garden. I've got, you know, friends, family, I, even my parents have gardens in their backyard now. Um, yeah, it's, it's very motivating to think, hey, you know, this thing could fall over at any time. And then uh, the White House today, they've – well, as we're recording this, uh, so I'm going to date the the recording. But uh, uh, they just released the minutes from Obama's new gun ban, and in it, he's basically restricting anybody that's not able to handle their own finances. They're not going to be allowed to purchase guns. So I, I'm looking at the <laughs> debt clock, $18 trillion and counting. Um, obviously the federal government is going to fall into that category. How are they going to arm the military if anybody that's not able to handle their own finances isn't able to buy a gun? Uh, uh, maybe this, this, uh, these pronouncements are secretly just going to bring in world peace. Everybody's just going to have to lay down their weapons, you know, put some flowers in the barrels of the guns like they were doing in the 1960s. <laughs> yeah. Flowers and good. candles. Now, yeah. you've got another great gardening book out. It's called uh, Grow or Die. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Grow or Die, The Good Guide to Survival Gardening. It uh, it came out in November, which is probably not the best time to release a gardening book, but it was written and we were ready to go, and the publisher said, hey, let's do it. And so we put it out, and it was a bestseller um, and is still selling quite well, but over the first month, um, it was just flying. We were sitting at the top of Amazon's gardening section for quite a long time. And, you know, it, with tensions with Russia and with the, you know, the, the potential for collapse, the potential for rioting. I mean, even look at the protests that are shutting down roads and there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And, and for, for the last decade or so, I've been seriously gardening and feeding my family, uh, uh, you know, a significant percentage of our food out of the backyard. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to write a book and, and imagine that you can't get fertilizer, you can't get gasoline, you know, you can't get a tiller, you can't go rent a tiller. How would you garden if you hadn't really done much gardening before and you, you know, were not able to rely on a bag of 10, 10, 10, you know, and an edger, right? I mean, how would you how would you feed yourself or get started? So, I wrote the book "Grow or Die" as a way to get people um, looking at the best gardening methods that are the most low tech gardening methods, the, the easiest way to store water or to even use the rain rainwater for irrigation. How to space your crops so you can grow um, without having to you know pump in water, and you know. 
uh, people will say, well, why don't you get a solar panel system? You could power your well, and why don't you stockpile a bunch of fertilizer and that sort of thing? There's a lot of people that really can't afford that. I, I've been told many times, hey, why don't you put in a solar panel system so you're truly off grid? And I said, well, I don't have the money for a solar panel system. So I have to look back, you know, 100 years in the past and say, how did people run things before they had complicated technology? So the book covers pest control. Um, there's a there's a big list of crops in the middle of the book. I cover preserving the harvest, how to fertilize, how to irrigate, um, and some tools that you've probably never heard of before, you know, broad forks and grub hose, um, tools like that that you can use to till the soil when you don't have a tractor or a tiller available. I even talk about how to um, plant a garden from the seeds that you could find in a uh, pantry, you know, which things are going to grow and which things aren't. Um, so the book is basically a crash course in gardening, and it's got a survival emergency quick start guide in the back like hey you find this book in the rubble how are you going to start feeding yourself um and so you know the the idea is is to put it into somebody's hand and it's quick and it's um got a ton of condensed gardening information to just get you going without looking at a regular gardening book where it says you know go buy peat moss and go buy 10 10 10 and go get a tiller and forget all that stuff i'm just assuming everything's collapsed and this is how you would garden if that was the case now, what are some of the different gardening methods that you've tried, and uh, and what are some that you mentioned in the book? Uh, for methods, I have tried uh, I've tried most of the mainstream gardening methods at one point or another um, because I, I figure as a garden writer, if I'm not actually doing it, you know, I'm, a lot you know a lot of people will just pass on secondhand information. So what I, I did about five years ago was I did. A double dug garden bed, John Jeevan's How to Grow More Vegetables style or biointensive style. And I did that um, alongside um, square foot gardening beds done exactly the way Mel Bartholomew says to do it in his book, All New Square Foot Gardening. Um, we also tried gardening in a barrel. We tried, um, you know, burying and planting burying uh, manure and logs and things like that and planting directly on top of them, which actually worked quite well. It's an old Native American method. We um, tr gardened. I planted a big section of a field about, I mean, it, it wasn't big compared to a farm, but, you know, 10,000 square foot or so of corn and grew it without irrigation after I interviewed an old farmer in the area and said, okay, how would you grow corn if you didn't have any water to your field? And so he told me how he spaced it and what he did, and we went ahead and planted corn, and we grew it that way. So I covered those methods and kind of the pros or cons. You know, right now, you, a lot of people will tell you the best way to garden, man, you got to do that back to Eden garden with a real deep mulch, and it makes beautiful soil. Well, this is true, but that system is also counting on the fact that you're going to be able to get truckloads of mulch or compost to even start that process. If you've got a collapse and you're looking at a front yard, where are you going to get all of the material to pile up a foot of mulch and plant in? So I cover, yes, if you have a lot of biomass, you know, the deep mulch gardening method or the back to Eden method works really well. However, if you don't, here's how you can stretch it out. Now, if you don't have water, here's how you can stretch it even further. You know, or here's how you can fertilize a large area with a small amount of um you know, for fertility. So I cover, um, I cover those methods. I cover how to loosen the soil and turn it up without a tiller. And, um, it is, there's a lot of bits and pieces of information from different methods that we tested and kind of give you the pros and cons. And it also relates to, are you dealing with sandy soil or loamy soil or clay soil? We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. 
When disaster strikes, it's too late to prepare. PrepperRecon.com offers Molly compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, EMT shears, suture kit, stera strips, tourniquet, ACS chest seal, tough strip bandages, gauze, and so much more. $89 includes shipping. To buy your individual first aid kit, go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the homepage. Order today before it's too late. And then chapter two is called How Much Space Does It Take? Can you can you give us a little teaser? <laughs> How much space does it take to, let's say, feed a family of four? Oh, man, it is such a it is such a in-depth question that it's one of those chapters I know will irritate people because realistically speaking, how much space does it take in the rainforest compared to how much space does it take in North Dakota compared to how much space does it take in Nevada? You know, um, the space issue is really dependent on climate. Say if you were um, down in Jamaica and you had fertile volcanic soil and you could, you could grow fruits and vegetables year round because of the tropical climate and you've got excellent soil and you've got excellent rainfall. So you could grow these gigantic African yam roots that are like 30 pound roots. And you could, you know, just be planting those things every four feet and be pulling thousands of pounds out of, you know, a, a tenth of an acre. However, if you went up to, say, Montana, um, you're really limited. You're not going to be able to do those kind of massive root crops that grow in the tropics. You're not going to be able to have something like a jabotacaba tree, which makes fruit six times a year. You know, you're not going to have um, a coconut palm that bears in three years and bears you a couple hundred pounds of high quality oil, fat, protein, you know, um, you, you're going to be looking more at grains and grazing animals and things like that. So you might need four or five acres in Montana compared to a tenth or a half of an acre in Jamaica, you know, depending on how you intercrop and what you grow. So, so the chapter on how much space does it take kind of, kind of takes you through how do you analyze your property um, how much time do you have? How much are you willing to work? What is the base fertility of your soil? I mean, here where I am in Florida, I have sandy loam, which is a really nice soil to work with. However, I've helped people plan food forest systems who are in very acid, yellow, white, almost beach sand type soil. And I tell them, look, you're not going to be able to get a garden like I have. We're both in Florida. We're both in the same climate, but your soil is not capable of supporting a garden nearly as easily as the soil that I bought. So you're looking at probably um, about 4,000 square foot under good conditions um, per person. So, you know, maybe 16,000 square feet should be able to keep your family fed. And if you're smart about it and you're able to intercrop and, you know, mix in chickens and things like that, you might spend part of your garden space just growing food for the chickens. And then you get higher quality food uh, in the form of eggs and protein, which will, you know, uh, keep you going. So, yeah, it's kind of, it's really going to depend on your climate. And uh, I try to, you know, I go through there and say, here's what you need to think about. And here's what you may be able to forage from the woods. And here's how the natives did it. And... You know, you, your your mileage will vary based on climate and soil. And then I heard you say grub hoe. That sort of sounds like one of those terms that you might get a, a phone call from the school if your kid uses it. Um, <laughs> can, can you talk to us a little bit more about tools? Yeah, yeah. Um, I am I am a big fan of of traditional hand tools and tools that actually work well. If you go down to um, the local hardware store and you pick up a shovel, I've done this before, bought a shovel or bought a spading fork and then you work with it for a year and the handle snaps and you find out that the inside of it was just a little piece of metal with a, you know, a plastic ring around it that held it in place and you get frustrated. So I've, I've, I looked at, you know, who makes the good tools and, you know, what were people using a hundred years ago before we turned all our manufacturing over to China and, you know, got a bunch of cheap garbage. And also 
what were people using before gardening got complicated? You know, um, the mantis little edger tiller thing that sells so well where you can till up this huge garden space with this tiny little motor and it's light and you see this pretty chick, you know, going around the edge of the garden with this cute little tiller thing and you go, if that thing broke, how would I ever fix it if I couldn't get pieces anymore? It's great for, you know, maybe somebody that wants to uh, do that now. It's convenient, but, you know, what did people do 100 years ago? So I started looking at African tools and European tools and, um, you know, the kind of stuff the settlers would have used. So the grub hoe, instead of being a, a little weeding hoe, uh, the grub hoe is really a digging hoe and a chopping hoe. It's got a about a two-pound head on it that usually runs about eight inches long with a sharpened blade. And it goes out at almost a right angle, just curved in a little bit towards the user. And so when you start chopping at the ground with the grub hoe, you can move soil really quickly by kind of letting the, the hoe head fall. You're doing a swing down towards the ground and throwing soil around. I mean, you could clear out weeds and chop down, you know, six inches, you know, right through hard soil uh, in, a, in a really quick period of time with a grub hoe. Whereas, you know, if you were trying to dig that same with a shovel, you're doing multiple motions and it's hard on your back and you're swinging your arms to the side. The grub hoe is like thwack, chunk, thwack, chunk, thwack, chunk. You're just taking pieces of the soil out. Um, yeah, you know, every time I mention hose, I get somebody, somebody has to make the joke about hose, you know, but um, I, I would not be without the grub hoe. I mean, it's it's an awesome tool, and there's a there's a company called um, Easy Digging that I bought mine from, and they they're like a solid forged steel head on a thick handle, and you can you can chop for quite a while before you get tired with one of those things, and it's basically your off grid tiller. And then you also said it, 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 a lot of people don't have the space, or they don't have the cash, or they just don't. They just don't have the desire to stockpile a whole bunch of fertilizer. Um, can you give us a couple of tips on, on making our own fertilizer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this ties into to my other book, Compost Everything, which is a companion to um, Grow or Die. The book Compost Everything, I cover pretty much how to take every bit of fertility that comes through your property and reuse it. You know, So everything from logs to meat, to urine, to, you know, the kind of stuff that people go, oh, man, you can't compost that. I said, well, how did God design nature originally? You know, all that stuff went back into the soil. It got used by the plants. And so if you're dealing with a garden space and you don't have fertilizer, the best method that I've found for fertilizing a large space um, with a minimum amount of uh, material is to do what's called uh, foliar feeding or, you know, um, all you're doing really is just taking a barrel and putting, you know, they call it compost tea or something like that, but it's more intense than a compost tea. I'll take a 55 gallon drum, throw in a shovel full or two of chicken manure if I have it, because it's real good hot stuff. If I don't have that, I throw in some cow manure or you mix some cow and some chicken manure. It doesn't really matter all that much. Throw in some compost. You can chop up um, weeds or throw in you know, a bunch of old crops and stuff like that in there and just let it rot. And you just top it off, top it off with water. So you just put a few shovelfuls of compost or um, manure, or you can take a couple of gallons of urine and pour it right in the bottom. Urine has a, a somewhat high salt content. It's also very high in nitrogen and can be used pretty much like miracle Grow, which a lot of people don't know. But if you were stuck and you go, how am I going to feed my corn? You know, I start peeing in jugs and then pouring it into this big thing in your backyard. So what you do is you top it off with water and then you stir it up and you let it sit for a few days to just percolate. And the, all that manure and stuff soaks up into the water and it smells terrible, but you can go out there. I take a couple of uh, watering cans with the little roses unscrewed at the end, so they just pour, the water just pours out of the front of them. And I'll fill two of those things up and walk down the rows of plants and just splash it right over or alongside the rows of crops. 
And that way you could take the equivalent of maybe four shovelfuls of compost and manure and spread it out over a large space. And we did this with our 10,000 square foot of corn, and I fed them with nothing but that manure and urine water with some compost in it. And I mean, it was, it was amazing how well that corn did, how green it was, how happy it was. I thought if I had taken four shovelfuls of chicken manure and tried to spread it over all this corn, you know, they would have got what, like a couple of thimblefuls each. It, did, it wasn't even practical. But when it came down to, to watering it out of that barrel, it was pretty easy. And it just kept fermenting there in the barrel, and I would top it off occasionally. And once or twice, I'd probably throw another shovelful in. But um, that lasted a long time. I got a whole season out of that barrel and probably consumed five or six shovelfuls over the course of the 90 days I was growing corn. And then I guess the same the same problem of being able to stockpile or a place to put it or uh, the wherewithal to purchase – uh, that same problem is going to exist for commercial pesticides. Can you can you give us some tips on what to do about the critters? Yes, uh, the critters are an issue, and it and that also depends. Like if you've got deer in your area, that's that's a major deer will destroy a garden faster than anything else. There's a lot of people that have moved to the country and they've got this great idea. Hey, I'm going to go to the country and homestead, and then they put in a garden and then they get up one morning and they have no garden. You know, you may want to plant you know, your garden a little further out so you can hunt and eat the deer because the deer are, um, frankly, a better source of almost everything than, say, cabbages. You can go a lot longer on venison jerky than you can on cabbage. But, um, you know, to protect your garden, first of all, you got to make sure you have some good boundaries or some good fences from the big guys. But after that, I have found that, you know, counterintuitively – a lot of people think that you have to control and get rid of all, you know, as many insects as possible. They kind of have an idea that, you know, the ladybugs are good and praying mantises are good. And everybody knows about those couple of good things. But in general, a lot of it is how do I kill the bugs? How do I kill the bugs? How do I kill the bugs? And people will put rows of crops that are all the same crop and then – you know, one after another after another, and then a pest species will show up, like, say, cabbage worms, and they will jump all the way down that entire row. You end up with, you know, infected cabbages, or you have aphids that just go plant to plant to plant. The ants drag them all the way down the row, and, you know, you've got aphids on everything, or you've got this on everything, or that on everything. The, a great way to make sure that you don't have major problems with uh pests just utterly coming in and destroying is to mix up plant species as you plant. So say you plant, you know, a, a few cabbages and a few tomatoes and a few peppers and a few onions and a few of this and a few of that. I'm not really all that particular about trying to figure out which plant loves which plant and doing all the companion planting, but just mixing up the crops helps. And then secondarily leaving weeds and um, areas where you have perennial Hedges of a whole bunch of different plants growing together. Basically, uh, hedgerows like the British used to grow. They had hedgerows of hazelnuts with a bunch of wildflowers and whatever else wanted to grow in between their fields. And what happens is all the little birds move in there. All of the predators move in there, the frogs, the lizards, the snakes, um, you know, the, the beetles. There's a lot of things that live in there year-round which will come out and eat the pests that get into your garden. And so you may think you're losing some space, but what you're actually gaining is 24-hour pest control. I, one thing we noticed was when I, I discovered a few years ago that wasps ate caterpillars. And I thought, you know, I've been knocking down wasp nests or spraying wasp nests for years because I don't, I, don't, like, I don't want them around the eaves of my house. I don't want them, you know, under here and over there. And so I'd see a wasp nest and I'd knock it down. Well, then I found out that, that wasps' primary food for their babies – is caterpillars. And so I, I stopped killing the wasps and I started watching my garden and I realized there's wasps in my garden all the time. I couldn't figure out why they were there. They'd be sitting on the tomato plant. They'd be sitting over here on the edge of the garden bed. I'm like, why are there wasps in my garden? They don't seem to be eating anything. And then I sat there and I watched them for a while and I saw one 
go flying off the edge of the garden bed down into the soil and grab a caterpillar and just start wrestling with it and tearing it to pieces. And it, and it ripped off big chunks of this caterpillar and it flew off back to its nest. And I went, whoa, there was already pest control in place and here I am knocking it out. I always thought, oh, wasps, you know, why did God make wasps? They're a pain in the neck, literally, you know? And it turns out that they were one of the best pest control. So I quit killing all the wasp nests. I actually put up old mailboxes uh, that a guy was getting rid of around the edge, top edge of my garden above my head so the paper wasps could go into the mailboxes and build nests because, hey, you know what? If you're going to go hunting in my garden all day and killing caterpillars, great. And so the same thing happens when you put in you put in habitat for the predator species and the prey species drop significantly. They tend to balance out because nature is always balancing. You get too much of one thing, the predators come and get it. And normally what happens in the garden is we get too much of one thing. And right around the time when we see there's aphids everywhere, we get out the spray and we spray it and we kill all the little baby ladybugs that were just coming in. But if you have a, you know, if you have a, a yard, that's just a whole bunch of grass and then you have one garden there that's all full of things that are delicious to pests the pests will find it rapidly they have really quick life cycles they'll come in tear your garden to pieces before the predators even find it so you know leave in perennials plant a fruit tree plant some shrubs around the base of the fruit tree plant some flowers around the base of that you know let your kids throw whatever wildflower seeds around that they want to and leave these patches of unmown untended area near your gardens and Nature's own pest control system will often jump in and fix most of your problems. There's a long answer to that, but um, you know, I found it's it really works well. <laughs> That's the end of the first half of my interview with David the Good. Tune in next week for the rest of the show. God bless and happy prepping. In the days of Noah, book three, Perdition, a global empire arises like a phoenix from the ashes of the world that was. The emerging order is unified by a new global currency and a single world religion, which are mandated by an imposed UN treaty. In the interest of unity and peace, a zero-tolerance policy for dissenters is enacted and strictly enforced. Hunted down like common criminals for daring to resist the state, Noah Parker's group will have to rely on faith and wits to endure the powers of darkness which are quickly consuming the earth. Buy your copy of The Days of Noah, Book 3, Perdition, by best-selling author Mark Goodwin in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition from Amazon.com today.